I will attempt to be loud and stay near the, uh, the mic so people can hear me. Uh, and hopefully the, the feedback situation will be better. Um, thank you, thank you to Fernando for coming and giving that keynote address. Um, that was really exciting, actually, when we came here. It was just a few buildings over and worked on the, you know, I think it was the first really earnest attempt at putting a different, a non-Python kernel behind what is now the Jupyter Notebook, and it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Only took us like a week. Still can't hear me? Okay. Um, so I'm here to talk about uh, PKG3, which is the code name for the, the new and improved next generation package manager that I've been working on for far too long. Um, it seems like an eternity at this point, probably both to me and to everyone else. Um, so I'm going to start out with a very depressing slide. Uh, it is all of the things that are wrong, and there's actually several of these slides, with the current package manager, PKG2. Back in the depths of time in Julia 0.1, there was PKG1, which I also wrote. Um, and uh, you know, I had never done that before. I'd never written a package manager, so I got a number of things wrong. Um, so one of the key things is that the metadata repository format uses a ton of small files, which you know I, I thought you know ext2 is good at small files. I can basically use it like a database, right? Then I don't have to write any parsers. Um, as it turns out, uh, file systems are not good at this, and w on Windows this is a total nightmare. Uh, so lots of small files, bad idea. Um, it's also just a sort of grab bag of ad hoc configuration file formats that are all pretty easy. They're very easy to write parsers for, but you do still have to write a parser for each of them, which is annoying. Um, so it would be nice to not have to continually write parsers for, for different file formats. Um, it makes the assumption, and I, I thought about this at the time, I remember being like, well, should a version be associated with a, a commit? In a, in a Git history, I made the decision to you know, tie, tie packages and to Git repositories, and I still actually like that, that whole decision. Um, so you could either associate a version with a tree, which is just the particular state of a, of a source tree, or a commit, which has history as well. Um, I chose the commit because it seemed like a, a better idea. You're sort of saying this particular point in time with all of this history is what this version is. As it turns out, this is a bad idea. Um, it forces you to use, uh, you, for the package manager to use Git to acquire things and verify that they're correct. Whereas if you just have a tree, you could, you, you could actually check that the hash of the tree, it's a pretty straightforward algorithm, that it's correct. And you could download it be, by some mechanism that is not Git. Um, we use libgit2 currently, which is great on Windows. It's much better, it's more performant, it uh, has proper Windows support. Um, the problem is that it doesn't do shallow clones, and so you end up having all of this history, even if the only thing you want is one particular snapshot. And some repositories have very, very large objects somewhere in their history, so we end up having to download those. Um, in particular, we feel a lot of pain with the Julia Pro distribution, which ends up having to be like 10 times bigger than it really ought to be, just so that we can have Git history in, of packages, and it's history we don't even care about. Um, Package renaming is a bit of a nightmare. Uh, it's not horrible. Uh, GitHub helps a lot here. They do redirects. Uh, so you know, if you do a rename, it actually works pretty well. The problem is if you rename one thing, if you rename stats to stats base, and then you make something else that is called stats, all hell breaks loose. Everything completely goes haywire. We did this in version 0.3, and it was a nightmare. It took like you know, half a year to a year to clean up the disaster that ensued. So, you know, it would be nice if renaming things wasn't a complete nightmare. Um, I designed the package manager to do development in place, which I thought was a kind of nifty idea. It's like, oh, I've already got the thing installed. It would be cool if I could just like open it up in an editor and already be ready to, you know, make a contribution. Um, I still like that idea. Um, I want to make that easy, but it has some real problems. So, I'd say like, 75% of the complexity of the package manager is trying to figure out when it is safe or not safe to update packages in place so that you don't clobber somebody's work because losing data is one of the worst things you can do. You know, I did a bunch of work and then the package manager decides to do something or other and deletes my work. That's horrible. You wouldn't want that to happen. So you have to do all of these very, very defensive and weaselly complicated things to try to avoid it. 
Um, it's also where a lot of the like little, small, slow git operations that you have to do come from, because those heuristics involve looking at commit history and repo state and all of that other stuff. And it's just it's very complicated and very expensive. Um, this was another idea that turned out to be a terrible one. Uh, version resolution uh, in PKG2 depends only on metadata and requirements. So basically it's like, look, here are the things that are available and how they relate to each other. Here are the things I need. Just tell me what I should have. What are the versions of packages that are optimal for me? Uh, it doesn't consider the current state of installed versions. So, you know, on paper this seemed like a good idea. It was somehow more reproducible in my head. I don't know. But as it turns out, what this means is that the package manager always wants to update all of your things all of the time. Um, and even if you do tiny little things like, I just want to remove something, now it tries to upgrade stuff too, which is just sort of a consequence of this design, which you know I hadn't thought through all the way. So we don't want to do that either. Um, we have package two also has very little support for tracking the precise versions of project dependencies. So you know I've got a project, I've got some stuff installed in, you know, you know, tilde.julia slash v0.6 or whatever version you're on. There's some stuff in there. How do you record what actually worked when you, you know, I ran something and it worked great for me and then I send it to someone else and they're like, well, what, you know, what, what versions of all of these things were you actually using that worked because I cannot get it to work. And I've, I've done this myself. I've inflicted this on other people. Um, it's, it's not a good situation. You want to be able to take a snapshot of these were the things I was, I was using, these are the exact versions of them, and you want it to be reproducible. Um, there's not a lot of support. There's a little bit of support. You can sort of do hacks with the Julia package dir environment variable, um, but there's no support for the virtual env style, you know, different environments where like this project has its own environment and set of package versions that it uses and this other thing has a different set of packages that it needs and actually they could be conflicting but since I'm not running them both at the same time, who cares? It shouldn't be a problem. Um, so I, I've definitely helped people hack together solutions to work around this but, you know, it'd be nice if it just worked. All right, package three to the rescue. It's going to solve all the pro problems. Um, the, there's a lot of inspiration from other systems. Uh, the three main ones, I would say, are virtual env, Python's virtual env system, um, which does, you know, so, some fairly like cute little tricks with uh, environment variables that let you just sort of have like a completely different independent system, you know, different version of Python, different version of, you know, different packages, and it's very convenient. People love it. Um, it's a really nice design. Um, Cargo, people really like Cargo, Rust's uh, package manager. Um, and Nix is uh, the package manager for Nix, uh, Nixos. And uh, the, the, the Nix, Nix in particular was in, an inspiration in terms of just sort of do, being immutable, just being like, okay, install the thing and leave it alone. So let's get to the, some of the design decisions. Uh, first of all, use Tomal, which is Tom's, uh, it's Tom Preston Warner, the same guy who made Semver came up with this basically any like but actually specified fairly simple configuration format. I don't love everything about it, but Cor Cargo is using it. I think Pip might be using it. It's, it's nice enough. Um, store more than one value per file. Well, that's a crazy idea. So then we won't make the, you know, the file system cry. Um, use UUIDs for package identity. I tried to sort of figure out a way around this, but you know, you just can't do it because one of the other concepts here, and we'll get to this on the next slide is that you want registries to be federated. And what that means is that someone could have, there's public registries and there's some, you know, private registries that you have behind a corporate firewall or in your research lab or wherever it is. Um, we can't possibly know what the names of all of the things are if the thing is federated. So the only way you can possibly have identity that's actually stable is UUIDs. Um, and once you have UUIDs, renaming things is just trivial. You just, you just don't, don't have any trouble with it anymore. Um, you know, an easy one, identify versions by tree hash, not commit hash. That is uh, pretty straightforward. Now all I need to know is, did I get the source right? Is this the source code that, you know, was in this other, in the version? I don't care about history. I don't need any, I don't even need Git to install it and verify it. Um, as a little side effect to this that I just realized the other day, um, it means that in, in Git, tree objects don't have to be rooted. So if you, act, you can actually have a subdirectory and have that be a tree and tag it as a version, which means that you can have multiple things in this living inside of the same repository. It's actually, it could be a very useful thing. Um, immutable installation. 
So the idea here is instead of installing things and then updating them in place, just install a particular version in one place and leave it alone. Don't touch it again until you just don't need it anymore and then just delete it. We got lots of disk space these days. Um, and in particular, one of the side effects of that is you can just pre-compile your package on install and then never touch it again. None of this business of looking at like, oh, did M times change or you know, God knows what that doesn't work on NFS or whatever other distributed file system. Just you know, do it when you install it and then don't touch it. Okay. Um, some names. I'm still, you know, these names are still up in the air. So if people have good ideas for names, um, terminology is hard. Uh, I came up with the term depot for basically a collection of things, um, which means <laughs> <laughs> it, it lives in the file system and it, you know, is a collection, a bunch of registries and a bunch of installed packages and a bunch of environment, you know, named environment things. Uh, and you just, you have, you have three of them. And the reason you have three of them is because you want a built-in one that you ship with Julia so that these are versions of packages that just come with the system. And you, you know, you, unless you're doing something weird, you don't delete them. There are, there's always this fallback version that exists. Um, then you want a system version because on some, some, on some systems, you want system administrators to sort of provide different versions of things so that people don't have to install their own software and they can just use stuff out of, out of the box. Um, and then the sysadmin would be you know, responsible for updating it and adding things to it and all of that. Um, but the user is not allowed to touch it because they probably don't have permissions, so that has to be in a different place. And then the user should be able to install their own stuff and that's in their home directory. So you need to have typically three levels of depot. A built-in immutable one, a system one that the user can use but can't m modify, and then the user one which the user can do whatever they want with. Uh, registries, it's basically the current metadata repository, but instead of there being a single global one, uh, you can have many of them, uh, and they can be public. You can have, we can have a curated registry, we can have an uncurated registry, and then we can have um, you know, private ones as well. Uh, and they can all provide different, you, know, you, could, you could do a private, your own named tag for some, uh, for some public package because you, you need an updated version, you need a fix. Um, and then you can eventually percolate that out to the public. Uh, environments are basically, you know, inspired by virtual env. It's a bundle of, it's the project local, you know, there's project local ones and then there's also global named ones and I'll show that in a little bit. Um, two files I ended up sort of settling on, I'm still working on the naming, I don't know, config.toml, uh, which is basically your pro project and pa slash package metadata. What is the name of the project? What is the author, what is the license, what are some keywords, what's the description. Um, also in there would be like, here are the, the UUIDs of the, and names of the things that I depend on. Here are the, but not their specific versions, just their identities. Then manifest.toml is the file that captures all of the details. It's the, the SHA hashes of the trees and the version numbers and if, you know, if they're only local, the path to uh, something or if it's installed from a URL, then the URL to get the, the source for something. Um, all of that stuff goes in the manifest file. Uh, so here are some of the operations that I'm, I'm, I've hacked out some of. Um, it's been a busy month, so unfortunately less, than, less of these work yet than uh, I would like, but I'll show you some of the ones that do work. Um, it's pretty much just package add at this point, but that's the hard one. Um, so basically, I, I want to have a, uh, a REPL mode for this. So currently it's done with Julia code, sort of PKG1 style. Um, but I think a REPL mode would be really nice with tab completion and you know, have it be interactive as well. So you basically add a package, optionally you can give it a version or version you know, specifier. Uh, you can remove packages. Those don't necessarily install or uninstall. Uh, what they do is they add and remove the packages to the current environment that you're operating in. Um, so if, if the thing, if the version hasn't been installed anywhere, then add will install it for you. But if it already exists, it won't have to install it. It just you know, adds it to the environment and already, it already is there. Uh, remove just removes it from you know, the config and manifest files and doesn't actually have to touch anything. Uh, one of the things we do, w the system does, is it keeps a log of manifests that it has used when, whenever you load through a, from a manifest so that then you can do this P, uh, PKG garbage collect operation 
which will go through and be like, oh, well, this thing hasn't been, this package isn't referenced by anybody, so I can delete it now. Uh, FSCK would be like, you know, go check that all of the identities of things are correct and that the source has actually not been tampered with, et cetera. Um, I think a sensible distinction between update and upgrade exists. Um, update is basically do all of the, the things that should not break my code, but updates things. So this is, all of my directed to dependencies only do point point upgrades. So a patch upgrade should not, if people are doing things right, break anything. Um, and so it's safe for me to do that. Um, indirect dependencies you can upgrade arbitrarily as long as they're still compatible because I don't have a direct dependency on them. Update is more aggressive. It'll be like, oh, well, you know, upgrade to the latest and greatest and, you know, give me a compatible set of things. Uh, and I'll see if I have to fix any APIs or not. Um, so you can, I can imagine that you would try doing a package upgrade and then, well, if, you're, if you don't feel like futzing around, you do a package update and then you see if every, it, hopefully everything just works. Uh, if you do an upgrade, then some things break and you either try to fix it or you say, I, I don't have time for this and you go back and revert it and do an, a package update. Uh, checkout is for editing, uh, editing, something, it's, so it's sort of the, the editing p aspect that I tried to get into the first version that caused so much trouble. This is just check out, check out a real git copy of this thing uh, in, a, in a local directory or in a global directory so that I can actually work on it. Um, status, just tell you some information. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a little of this working now. All right, so I will Restart the process. Okay, so a couple things. This works on Julia 6 at this point, not zero, Julia 0.5, not master. Um, it also currently breaks uh, pre-compilation, and I have to sit down and get Jameson to help me figure out how to work around this, so I have to turn off the compile cache at the moment. Uh, okay, so the package manager is a package, so there's some sort of bootstrapping problem we have here, but uh, you just say, using pkg3, uh, one of the things that does is it messes with your load path. So currently I have it, I don't wanna be mess, I, you know, we could, you could have other things in there, but basically what it does is it puts this special object uh, that loads installed packages, and there's gonna be another type of object that uh, auto installs things for you if you want that kind of behavior. So if, if you can't find an installed one, it can auto install, and that can also go in the load path. Um, and you can see this is my user depot, and that's the path that it's going to be operating on. Um, I don't have any other depots on the system, but a typical install when this is all said and done will have three of these, so you'd see three of them to look at. Um, okay, so how does this work? Well, okay, uh, let me... Okay, so the package that I'm actually gonna show you is the PKG3 package itself. Um, and we can see what it's got done here. Um, I probably should have checked this stuff in before I got up here. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I have some changes here. I'm actually gonna roll them out, git co-f. Um, Okay, so what you can see here is I'm gonna actually delete the manifest file um, and we can look at the config file. Uh, and so there's the config file and basically what it says is it's got, you know, it's got my name, they're in alphabetical order. I think we'll figure out a way to make this look nicer. Um, this is, this is the like formatted output from the Tomo package that I'm using. Um, and then these are the dependencies and they're the names of them and there are their U, UUIDs. So let's delete these. Um, and what will happen now that we've deleted them, yeah. <laughs> You'd think I would have gotten used to how OS X does this paging thing by now, but okay. Um, so now what we can do is we can try to load something. Um, and I don't know, let's try to use uh, the SHA package. So I happen to know that's in here. Okay, so it says, okay, you know, that's not found. So let's do pkg3.add. Um, 
and let's just give ask for the SHA package. And I don't really care what version it is, so that's fine. And this is the usual, it's compiling code, and because nothing is pre-compiled, it's ex 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 especially slow. It's actually pretty, after you've done it once, it's actually pretty quick. So it resolves UUIDs, it tries to figure out what the names of things are, then it tries to figure out versions, and then it updates the config file. And you can see the config file is actually in this local directory. How does it find the config file? Well, uh, there's a find config, Oh, yeah, I keep doing this, pkg3, not pkg. Um, there's a find config function, and what it does is it does a, it does a couple things. It tries to be a little bit smart. Uh, if you are in a Git repository, it goes to the top of where the Git repository is and looks for config.toml and manifest.toml. Um, if julia config.toml or julia manifest.toml exists, it'll use those instead and ignore config so that we can play well with others. Um, now, you can change this. Currently, it's with an environment variable, but there will be you know, command line flags for this eventually. Uh, and you can say slash. Slash has a special meaning. Um, slash means look, in the global, look for a global environment by default. Um, and now it'll change that. And what it does is it looks in .julia environments. And by default, it uses the major and minor version number as the name of a default environment, and then there's a config file. There's actually no file by that name um, at the moment. If we try to look at it, we'll see. Oh, there is. Yeah, yeah, all right. Um, oh, yeah, I installed Gadfly, which took forever. Um, yeah, so. So this, this is the thing, if you're not in a Git repository or other local project, or if you're in a local project that doesn't have a config, then this is what you get, you get loaded, um, which is convenient that lets you just sort of do REPL work wherever you want and have a set of packages that you like. But if you don't have that set, um, or if you have it set to dot, then you work in the local directory. Okay, so let's, let's see what happened here with the, with the Okay, so we see that when we did the add, we ended up getting the SHA file. So SHA depends on compat, so we get a particular, the UUID for compat and SHA, tell, this tells us that that's what we've got. Um, and the manifest file, which I had deleted, now has a section for compat with the SHA1 hash, the UUID and the version that is installed, and SHA has a similar thing. Um, now another thing that we wanted here was we wanted pkg3.add, um, Let's see, uh, let's see, I had a list of them here at some point. Uh, obviously I was playing around with this. Yeah, here are the things that I actually need for this. Okay, so this was wildly fast. The reason it's wildly fast, it's a bit of a cheat. I already have the cloned repositories and I already have these installed. Um, so let's stop cheating and actually delete those. And let's see where these actually we, where these live. Um, environments. So I'm in the .julia directory. So environments. I have the v0.6 environment, and you can see that it's got a config and a manifest file. Um, you can see registries has got a named uncurated is the named one, and then you can see that it shards by the the first letter of the package name, um, and it has tomble files that. Um, you know, one of them is just a little bit of metadata about the registry, and then another one is an index of all of the packages, including their UUID, their name, and the path that they're at. So the path is in this file so that we can just change it if we want to change the way the sharding is done or whatever, whatever we need to do to make things work. It doesn't, doesn't matter because it's just saved in here. Um, and this is all of our packages. It's not a huge file. It loads very quickly. Um, I used some regex. Um, chicanery to make it parse it even faster and sort of because I know exactly what format it has. Um, all right, and repos, these are just a bunch of bare git repos. Um, and you can see that's just, just a bare git repo. So let's start deleting some things. Because, um, you know, this is a tried and true tradition that you delete things in the package manager. That's how you fix everything. Um, Hopefully that will not be the case so much. So I'm going to delete a bunch of repos. Um, and I'm going to delete all my installed packages. There we go. So they're gone now. 
All right, so now we're going to try installing the same things, and you'll see that it takes a little longer. OK, so now it has to com clone cl combinatorics. And we'll, this is a test of how good the internet is. Ah, awkward pause. Maybe I shouldn't have deleted the repos. <laughs> <laughs> is it a shell at one? Huh? Is it a shell at one? Is it a what? Uh, no, it does a full clone because once you have the clone, you can check out any version that is in the clone. Um, yeah, all right, so much for this. Yep, the Wi Fi's. <laughs> anyway, um, so one of the nice things here is that once you have a thing installed, if you create a new environment and you stall, install you know, the packages that you were already using, so you don't actually have to install another copy. You're stu you still are using the same copy. You're just referencing it by creating this environment file that, that knows how to look it up. Um, and it's just instantaneous. Um, if you already have the cloned repo, even if you're sharing it across multiple versions, so I mean, this happens to me pretty regularly because I switch different versions of Julia all the time. Um, and it's like, I just installed that package. Why do I have to download it again? Well, you know, if the repo is already cloned, it's shared across all Julia versions. There's no reason to make it specific. Um, even the, you know, if the source tree is the same, you just, you just share it. Um, but you can just very quickly install things. And I've, when I've played with libgit2 installing so from source trees with a clone already existing, it's very, very snappy. Um, and that's, a lot of that is because it doesn't have to do any, it's not doing a git clone, it's just make it, putting the source tree in, in place. Um, all right, so since that's not happening, um, anyway, I will go back to my presentation. All right, so. All right, so my final, final slide is some open questions. Um, there's actually still a ton of work to do, and I hope that once I put this out there later today, people will you know, feel, feel encouraged to like, help and chime in and tell me I'm doing things wrong, whatever, all of that. Um, some config fig file design needs to be worked. Right now, I did the stupidest, most verbose thing possible. We probably should do something a little bit better. Uh, the version resolution thing is wildly nasty. I spent a couple of months trying to tame this beast, and I, uh, I, the whole time I thought I was like on the verge of figuring it out, and then at the end I was like, I got to time box this and actually implement some stuff. Um, but I'd love to, a way to figure out, figure out a way to restrict the problem space to make it more manageable and predictable. Um, package namespaces. So this is the thing people have wanted. Uh, I don't know how this would work or what it would look like, but you know, maybe something like using Julia opt slash jump, so that you know there can be another thing called jump that is a package that uh, draws a picture of someone jumping or something. You know, uh, be very popular, I'm sure. Um, or maybe I don't know URLs and people's GitHub uh, user accounts to 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 you know to namespace things. I'm not sure. This needs some design. Um, coexistence of packages with the same name in the same Julia process. I was talking to Jeff about this. He seemed horrified by the idea. Um, th the real problem is actually when you depend on something that indirectly depends on something that has a name that you were already using to mean something else. That you know, is a real gotcha. And then finally, libraries and binary, aka binary independencies, bin depths too. Um, I think that uh, Kenno and Tony Kalman and a bunch of other people have ideas, and hopefully they will, you know, forge ahead with that. All right, thank you. <laughs> Do I have time for a question? All right. Okay, uh, all the way in the back. Yeah, that's, yeah, so the question was conditional dependencies. Um, that is definitely a thing we need a solution to. The, I don't think we're going to do conditional modules because that seems kind of nasty. I think the model for that will be that can, there will be sort of, cer certainly you can say that like you can put compatibility constraints on some, on a package without actually requiring it, which you can't currently do. So that will be straightforward. Um, the real thing you need is you usually need some kind of glue. 
Um, and the model that I think we're leaning towards for that is to just have sort of a, you know, a data frames gadfly package, sub package or something that, you know, provides the glue for data, fr data frames and gadfly. Um, and that can even live in one of those repositories. And that's one of the, uh, that's one of the places where the fact that a, a, a package can actually be, a package version can be associated with a subtree of a Git repo could be very handy. Um, that, that also needs some design work. Um, another question. <laughs> What's the migration story if two, package two and package three coexist? Uh, yeah, they actually are right now. Um, so if I don't clear out the load path, you can load things with either one. Because basically, I just, I just, there's a load hook mechanism that lets uh, you know, weirdo objects that aren't strings in the load path do whatever they need to. Um, and that's how PKG3 is working. But the same, the same mechanism works for both. And whatever finds something first uh, wins. Um, uh, the migration in terms of metadata is at some, I, I mean, currently I'm generating those registries from metadata, so at some point we'll have to switch over. Um, but I think that's doable. Uh, okay, yes, Tim. Right, right. Um, yeah, I think that should be easier because environments can be shared across different versions of Julia now. So you can have a named environment um, and then just test it. Uh, I also was just thinking that you know you would have uh, either either a local editing space, so a, you know default place in in your current project where if you ask for a local checkout, that's where you would get it, the source. Um, and the way that, w and, and if it's global, there would be some other global place which you could configure, but there would also be a default location. Um, the key principle there is that you should record in the manifest all of the information needed to reproduce a piece of, a state of the system. And so if you have an upstream, if you're using a commit that you know exists upstream, <coughs> then it's okay, enough to just keep the URL and the commit. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> it's enough to have the, the URL and then the commit that you were on because it was it's it exists upstream. Um, if you're doing local editing, what you have to capture in the manifest file is the path because it only exists locally, and so that would be how you would indicate. Oh, I'm doing local editing on the on the config side. Um, I, I think it just works fairly smoothly. I, I but yeah, remains to be seen, of course. All right. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. <laughs>